Welcome to the last session of DrupalCon. You guys made it. Congratulations. Hopefully we'll end this on a high note. So my name is John Ferris, and this is Garrett Dawson. We're uh, front-end developers at Atten Design Group. Um, I've been doing design web development for quite a while. I've been working with Drupal since, I don't know, probably 2009, I think. Um, I've been working with Drupal since, I think, version 6, uh, kind of as a front-end developer on a good day, custom module developer on a bad day. Um, so that's a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. So you can follow us on Twitter, uh, on Kill the Litter, on IG, Twitter, on Pixel Lit. Pixel underscore with some other gap beaten to it. Uh, we are front end developers at Atten Design Group. Um, we you know, work with a lot of different sorts of organizations uh, doing uh, good work throughout the world. We speak to a few of our clients. Um, yeah, so Atten's based in Denver, Colorado. Atten's uh, based in Denver, Colorado. We also have an office in Rochester, New York. Um, yeah, like Garrett said, we're doing work with uh, companies that do good work all across the world. Um, a lot of journalism, education, sites, and health organizations. So what we're going to talk to you today about is custom tailored teams. Um, what we mean by that not necessarily a custom theme for a specific project, so like every project has one of those, but more about the tools that you use to start a project with. So in Drupal, there's, there's all Drupal sites come in all different shapes and sizes, as do the teams that build those sites. So your team might be, I don't know, a dozen people. You might have a designer, information architect, Content strategist, sysadmin, back end developer, front end developer, um, or you might just be one person sitting in a basement doing the work of 10 people. But to say this presentation, we'll call you a team. Um, so, what we hope to do today is just encourage you to kind of evaluate your team, the site you build, and the way you work, and then tailor a custom theming process to that, that will hopefully improve your efficiency as you work. Um, so it's kind of important, I think, to first sort of define our problem domain as front-end developers. Um, you know, we then have like a better understanding of the things that we need to address. Uh, so, you know, typically as a front-end developer, you're interacting with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, that's the stuff that we like, that's the stuff we're comfortable with. Influence on whenever we can, um, but you know, like so many things, there's uh, complex systems like Drupal out there, and a lot of times we find ourselves working with them. Uh, and then you, as a front-end developer, find yourself working with all these other sorts of things. You've got, you know, template files. You've got render arrays. You've got pre-processed functions, process functions. Just the list goes on and on and on and on. And you arrive at this notion of a themer. Um, and that's kind of like an apt name for a front end developer in Drupal because it's often the theme where we try to exert the most influence. So, um, themers, you know, we, we uh, go out to, and hang out with each other and, and uh, kind of discuss different approaches to this problem domain of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And something that comes up just over and over and over again, people will ask you, they'll ask me, like, John, what kind of fix do you need? Uh, well, it depends. I've answered that question quite a few different times, or quite a bit, few different ways. Um, but I think your answer to that question should be based upon a lot of different factors. You know, a base theme and contrib has got to make a lot of assumptions about your process and your workflow. So basically, the base theme that you use 
tailored to your process. Yeah, that's, that's ultimately what we're advocating is just that um, rather than, like, have that discussion, like, what's your starting point, um, we think that you probably know yourself better than anybody else, and you can achieve probably the best front-end tooling um, rather than, you know, working within the constraints of the assumptions of, of uh, you know, for instance, the trip fees, which are super awesome. Uh, there's a great place for, for that. Uh, I kind of think that it just depends on, like, what your goals are. And, and if you're a front-end developer, what you want to think about is how to affect HTML and CSS and JavaScript in, in the most complete way. It's probably, like, to, uh, front-end tooling and using a, a team process, a team kit uh, that you can develop yourself. So, so in figuring out what, um, what, what to build your tools around, um, there's a ton of questions you want to ask yourself. Uh, we've listed a few here. But, um, you know, one would be what type of projects are you building? Are you working in uh, with journalism sites? Is it um, like a learning platform? Do you build commerce sites? Are they retail? Um, does your company focus on just real estate sites? Um, or are you working on one site and just iterating on that one site over and over? Yeah, you typically are, are going to be addressing the same sorts of problems and uh, maybe like replicating work over and over if you're just kind of kicking off from, you know, something that you didn't make yourself or you didn't bake yourself. So um, that that's kind of our idea of, of how you approach this. And, you know, we're, we're not alone at all in that uh, we've had the opportunity to uh, reach out to a lot of other front-end developers and, and have some discussions with them about how they, you know, choose to create their team stack or their front-end tooling. Um, and that's what we're, we're, we're going to kind of talk about some of those uh, as like exemplary, uh, exemplary, uh, exemplary examples, exemplary examples, there you go. Um, so, talk a little bit about Stanford University. Um, has anyone heard of Open Framework? A few people? Awesome. Um, we had a chance to talk with uh, Megan Miller and Brian Young do a lot of work on that. Um, so Stanford University has a uh, a team within Stanford IT Services called Stanford Web Services, and Stanford work Web Services provides services kind of at a discounted rate to um, different departments and faculty or Stanford-related organizations. Um, but as one of their services, they have, um, let's call it Stanford Sites. And Stanford Sites is basically, you can kind of think of it, I guess, as a um, sort of a Drupal Garden specific for Stanford. Uh, basically, it gives a free site to any students or faculty or departments that um, need a Drupal site. And so basically, Stanford Web Services is seven staff members, but they're managing over 900 sites right now, all maintained on the same code base. So that itself presents a lot of challenges, um, a, lot of, a lot of issues dealing with security. People can spin up a free site, but they can't add any custom code to it. So to handle that on the the theme in they built is called Open Framework. Um, Open Framework is a series, a set of um, themes in which people can, can build their sites. Um, so Open Framework itself is a, a base theme, kind of the bottom layer base theme. It's based on Twitter Bootstrap, basically provides um, just some of the basic functionality that one would need to work within the Stanford sites. Um, a lot of layout features, which is kind of the big selling point of that. Um, and on top of that, they have another base thing called Stanford Framework. And essentially what that's doing is just adding the Stanford branding on top of Open Framework. And then on top of that, they have additional themes to choose from. I think they have three right now. And those just add some additional kind of custom.
customizations to the, the theme itself or to the Stanford framework. So it's still branded Stanford. It follows their, their strict branding guidelines, but it's adjusted to give people a little bit of variety. A little bit of a variety. Uh, so we're not just like plugging this open framework or anything. We're really talking about, uh, you know, someone had like a really specific need. They, they know them, their, their issues and their problems, their challenges better than anybody. And rather than rely on Contrib um, to um, solve these problems for them, they instead like adopted ideas out of Contrib and kind of repurposed things and created this like really custom tailored uh, system for, for their needs. Um, and it, it's working, like John mentioned, uh, it's working really well for them. They're maintaining a huge number of sites successfully uh, with this code base. Um, and so another uh, company where we had an opportunity to speak with front-end developer uh, is Kalamuna. Um, these guys are based out of California as well. I think they're uh, pretty close to, where are they at? Uh, I think Oakland or Oakland. Uh, yeah, and we, we talked with some fellows over there. They told us about this unique approach that they take uh, with their theming, with their tooling, um, and they kind of describe why uh, they're doing that. So. Uh, they, you know, have this unique approach, which is, you know, based on Panoply and Bootstrap. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Panoply, but um, John just said he'll kind of describe that real quick. Yeah, does anyone know what Panop or, sorry, Panoply is? Uh, Panoply, <laughs> Panoply, Panoply. So, well, basically, uh, Panoply is a distribution that's based all around uh, panels. And it really, it adds some, some layouts and a lot of kind of that baked in functionality that if you were going to build sites or distributions with, um, with panels, it's, it's got a lot of that set up and they've made a lot of improvements to the UI of panels. Um, so Calamuna has kind of chosen that as their um, main, I guess, development tool. So... They built Calatheme on top of Panoply. There's actually a hard dependency on it. You can't install Calatheme without Panoply. And they've catered that specifically to Panoply. Um, one of the really interesting things that they're doing, um, so one of their, their challenges or um, their focus is they've traditionally been a more back-end focused shop. And I believe they've, um, they're working to add in more design resources into their team. But um, so for, for back-end developers that want to focus on the actual functionality and um, uh, the, I guess, custom development, uh, they've also chosen to use Twitter Bootstrap, which turns out to work great for them because they don't need to concern themselves with CSS for the most part, and uh, they've really kind of decided, like, and this is, I think, something that all of these organizations do, all these front-end developers or just, you know, Drupalers do. They decide how they want to work. Uh, they standardize around it, and they really empower themselves to continue working uh, through their front-end issues that way. Um, so, yeah, check out uh, Kala Team. I think it's pretty interesting and inspiring how they just have it, like, pluggable with these different Twitter bootstrap themes. Um, another, you know, really unique site um, and unique set of needs is examiner.com, which John actually, uh, he's done some work for them and worked on their theming approach, their front-end approach. Yeah, so if you're not familiar with Examiner, it's a big-ass Drupal site. It's huge. They have a bajillion nodes. Yeah, over 12 bajillion nodes. I think over 12 million nodes. And they're adding, or they're adding um, kind of over 7,000 nodes are being created every day. It's a crowdsourced, um, I don't know if crowdsource is the right, right term, but it's a uh, pretty user-driven uh, news site. Um, so with, with a site that size, you can imagine that um, security, code quality, time are incredibly important. And so when I was there, which was a little over a year ago, um, I was one of four front-end developers working on um, this 
single side. And I think, are there three there now? Three. So if I'm saying anything wrong, that's, that's no longer correct. Correct me, John. Um, so, so yeah, they have very specific workflow and like very strict code quality standards um, and code review process. And on the theme side of that, uh, they had a stack of themes. And the base one was a, developed by um, Al Stefan. Uh, it's called uh, it's called Pure. And Pure is basically we like to call it a utility theme. Like it doesn't it doesn't add any CSS or templates or any kind of overrides. Basically, the utility theme is one that just kind of extends basic Drupal functionality. So what Pure is doing is it, it helps facilitate that code organization by automatically um, allowing you to define, or define and include directories in your template.php file. So you can spread out like your template.php file. I don't know if anyone does a lot of custom development within that, but you should probably know on a large site, that file gets huge. So what this allows is um, and break out their .eat files into separate folders. And the way that is organized is so you have basically a module or a custom module that's written um, for a certain feature, functionality, whatever. Then in the theme, there's a subfolder that's specific to that module that holds all the CSS, all the, you know, alter hooks, all the pre-process functions that are specific to that module. And that comes in really handy when you have those big sites and you're on a two-week release cycle. Um, you know, say you coded something like a, uh, an alert for a special event that's going on. Once that alert is done and they sunset that module and disable it, then the themer can go in and just close down that, or basically uninclude that folder or rip it out altogether. And then that way, that CSS gets pulled out. So it's just a way of keeping up, uh, uh, basically keeping your CSS and your code clean. And um, if you want to know more about that, bug Al Steph, Al Steph, and he's right there. He's done some pretty cool stuff with it, and it'll blow his mind. Uh, yeah, so they, again, like this is an instance where this front end uh, approach had to address really specific needs. Um, they, you know, really tailored their system so that they could solve it in the most efficient and uh, most maintainable way. Uh, that's something that, you know, we talk a lot about is um, how does our team work? How do we empower our team to, like, move code back and forth uh, without, you know, having to, like, spend hours reconfiguring things or, you know, enabling features or using features? to move that code. Uh, it's just, again, like, we're trying to, as front-end developers, I assume, like, a lot of us in this room are front-end developers, we just want to exert as much influence on that code base and make it do exactly what we want it to do. Um, another kind of interesting example of this is um, this company called Code Enigma. They have, like, a, a really interesting uh, team that is has, like, really strong design sense. Uh, we, we had the opportunity to speak with some guys over there as well, and this is, um, this is you know, again, we're like relaying what they told us, and hopefully we're not just totally botching it, but uh, they told us that they have this approach where they like prototyping with HTML and CSS, um, you know, like so many people do, but a lot of us in Drupal don't do that often because then we're duplicating tons of effort within Drupal. Uh, so what they've chosen to do is use a panels-heavy approach, uh, pretty much do away with the theme layer altogether, at least in the sense that they're not using templates to really control their markup. Um, they're, they're taking like an additive approach to their, their front end tooling. Um, and they arrived at this idea of like the death of the theme. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if you, if you haven't seen this talk, it was, um, it was given at uh, Drupal Camp London this year, and I believe at Front End United. But um, there's a link to the session video on, on YouTube. It's a very interesting approach. Um, essentially what they're doing is kind of facilitating um, a, tra like a more traditional 
front-end developer that can, you know, code the HTML and CSS by hand, not necessarily having to worry about the way Drupal does it. And then, you know, as we pointed out earlier, the concept of themers, front-end developer that needs to know all this other junk about Drupal just to make that stuff work. Um, so this approach kind of eliminates that by allowing the front-end developer to focus on their CSS, focus on the HTML, and then they can use a site builder, you know, leveraging tools like panels and display suites, um, you know, panels everywhere, and panelizer, panels, whatever. Um, basically, to craft that markup that's already been written, written and all that CSS, and all through the UI. Yeah, and they've, they've really, like, a lot of these people, they just empower themselves to, to mess with that stuff the way that they want to do it. Um, and that's, like, the, the, the point we're trying to drive home more than any other is that that's the kind of thing that you can achieve when you start creating your own front-end stack and, um, you know, custom tailoring um, all of this to your needs. Uh, so one of the things that we can talk about today, uh, probably, you know, more than any other, is uh, how we do this at Atten. We have a sort of set of uh, systems that we use. Uh, we have a really unique, I think, well, maybe it's not unique, but we have, like, an internal team that works in a particular way. Um, and we, as a front-end team, have approached those problems with our own set of custom themes and uh, theme, like, utilities and, you know, team utility modules. Um, and we just relaunched this site today, actually. So if you're interested in checking that out, I would. Uh, but we have this um, idea of uh, using SAS and SMAX uh, wherever we can and, and, and in whatever way. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to focus this. We're using SAS, so we standardized around SAS. We built a theme that really leverages SAS and, and uh, sort of gives us a good starting point. So we have uh, sorts of clients that we're always, you know, like we mentioned right at the beginning, we have a certain sort of project that we're typically doing, and we created this custom uh kickoff form, which I think is uh, a great idea. If you find yourself like cutting and pasting a lot of code from other projects that you've done, uh, why don't you just like roll that into your own sort of thing. Uh, so our, our theme stack works like this. We start out with this utility theme called Center, which um, John can talk a little bit about. Yeah, so Center is basically, again, it, it does some template overrides, but it's, it's facilitating the use of Preprocess functions to add classes to various things. So there's certain things that um, templates and functions within Drupal core where you just can't get at a, a certain class without overriding things. Um, so this basically it's a it's a little bit further starting point for us than just using Start. Um, we've also built in some various uh, you know, custom like field theme functions and custom templates that we could then use theme hook suggestions to add those to our, to our projects. Um, so that's center. It's, it's basically what it does. Uh, it strips out some CSS as well. Um, but then on top of that, we have um, we call this one more of a starter theme, I guess. A prototype. My prototype is meant to be. You know, we don't want to worry about having to update the prototype once a site's launched if we, you know, make updates to the code base that's on Google.org. Like, it's meant to be, you install it, give you a starting point, and then you just hack away at it. Um, yeah, it's a lot like, like something like Zen. Uh, you know, we, we did publish it to uh, D.O. so that you guys could compete and, you know, maybe someone else finds it useful. But, I mean, really, we're, like, scratching our own itch, and that's, you know, why we created it. Uh, that's, I think, the, more than anything, it, it came out of, like, self-evaluation. You know, we use Display Suite uh, to control our field markup a lot of the time. And that has, like, as many of you probably know, that has, like, really unique issues or uh, problem sets. Um, and we have to adapt to that problem set. So we know, like, you know, some some things in Detroit, they do take into account, like, uh, total workflows. I think I've never really used Omega, but I think, I think that's how Omega works. You know, it's meant to be used with all these different utility modules. Uh, but that's not typically the case. So there's, like, assumptions made, um, and maybe they're the wrong assumptions. So we know we use Display Suite. We, we know that we use uh, the U modes really heavily, um, and we cater to that in our, our custom uh, front-end themes. 
So that kind of like segues to how you should approach this. If you're interested in empowering yourself to have more control and exert more influence over your front end, uh, you really need to evaluate yourself, your team, uh, your approach, what it is you want to do. So get your measurements. Um, you know, and when we say that, that's just like all these uh, companies, all these front end developers, they've uh, become really aware of uh, the needs that they need to meet. Uh, you know, Stanford, they're not trying to create like an easily uh, manipulated uh, theme from a code base, but they're trying to um, create something that's really easy to work with via UI. Um, I think examiners trying to uh, create something that uh, everything's like super isolated and, and trans like just transportable. I, I think with the file directory. Yeah. So basically, when we say get your measurements, take a look at your team. You know, what are your strengths? Try to capitalize on those. When you like for us, we want to we want to write JavaScript and CSS, and we want to write CSS the way we want to. Um, so, Center enables us to you know, get that power over classes and put classes where we want. Um, you know, think about who's going to be maintaining the site after you launch it. Um, support is one of our offerings, and we end up maintaining the sites more often than not that we that we launch. And so we have that benefit of you know we know SAS. We don't have to worry about who's maintaining it later if they can get in and edit SAS or install a Ruby gem. Um, Stanford has you know people maintaining their sites are those site builders. You know it's a it's a graduate student who doesn't necessarily have or need to have you know Drupal or HTML like skills. You know, and they've, they've built it so that in case there's a student that does, they can just start with Open Framework and add CSS via, via and they can't have custom code, so they they use code or CSS and Jacker module, which, you know, a lot of us would probably frown on that in a normal situation, but that, that fills their need and it works really well. begin to kind of evaluate your, you know, your goals as a team or the goals of your projects or your skill sets, um, you know, take the time to do that and then just start, you know, hacking, start building your own, um, roll something out of start. I don't know that anybody's like, I've, I've never really looked too closely at start, but I know John has, and I think it's uh, really, like, if you turn it on and you enable it and you see just the raw stuff that's getting dumped out of Drupal, then you can kind of start to get really comfortable and familiar with the theme layer. Uh, and empower yourself to uh, just become like a front-end developer instead of just like, I, I don't know, I make it as agnostic as possible, I guess, to your, your front-end toolkits. Um, so start building and, and uh, you know, just continually improve. So uh, that, that's uh, what we do with Prototype. Um, we have the opportunity to do that because we, you know, are maintaining and supporting most of our projects ourselves. So we, every time we kick it off, maybe we want to adjust a little bit, and we have the freedom to do that. I think that some of us maybe have this sense that if we're getting it out of contrib, uh, we don't want to, like, change it too much. Like, these guys have superpowers, and they, you know, made, like, these great decisions. But that's not always the case. Like, they're just, you know, they're front-end developers, too. So um, I think that let's just, like, dispel that idea and uh, feel like we... we know what we want, and uh, we should empower ourselves to do it. Yeah, so the way we kind of handle this continuous improvement idea is, um, you know, as we're working with the project, and, you know, we're kicking off the site, we're getting in there, and moving a prototype, and we're, we start hacking away on it, and it's like, uh, man, we, these buttons have too much styles out of the box. Um, let's go back and strip that out. Um, you know, or I'm, I'm doing the same thing that I just did on the last project. Let's let, add that in. So a lot of times we'll just put my cop over to the um, prototype directory, directory and, you know, do some commits and push that up, and that's it. Other times we'll actually, you know, if you're in the middle of a project, you don't have time to switch um, workspaces, so you just log into Google.org, you know, write a 
quick issue, and then that way when we're starting the next project, we kind of start at that at the very base again. We'll take a little bit, a little bit of time at the beginning to just kind of go through and clear out some of those issues. You know, we don't always get to all of them, but you know, just continually improve on your base and tune it. Um, you know, if your work, if your your workflow is changing a bit, then adjust it to that. And what's to be gained from uh, you know spending the time to actually like roll this theme? Uh, you, you become more efficient with that theme because you're super comfortable with it. Uh, you you uh, know where things are getting generated. You know why and how they're getting generated. So you just go in there and uh, you know do whatever you want. I guess it's ultimately I guess what we. So yeah, to conclude, nobody knows you like you. Uh, that's generally the case. So you, you know, take your take stock of your situation and take stock of your skill set, um, and, and uh, you know, get comfortable with some throughput. I guess you know, basically get out there and start building stuff and reuse it. Yeah, iterate um, constantly. Uh, incorporate cool ideas that you uh, gain from other front end developers. You know, Frankenstein something together. Uh, we're just really we're talking about like a custom front end. Uh, toolkit. So if you really like something that, you know, theme A does and you just want to slam that into like your own custom starter theme, I think, you know, that's 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 what you ought to do. That's, and in fact, I think that's what a lot of people do. They end up sort of like forking Zen or forking this or that because they always end up working with it in a particular way. And, and that's a really great idea. Just like giving yourself, positioning yourself to be as efficient as uh, you can be. Um, just working the way that you want to work. That's about it. <clears throat> some time for questions. Do you want to ask questions? Do you guys have responsiveness built into your center team? Definitely. Yeah. So part of it we have a lot of responsiveness is has a lot to do with layout, and we purposely not started with too much, too many layout assumptions in our theme. But as far as SAS goes, we automatically include um, breakpoint for our media queries. Is there a theme that you are getting that base information from, or is this something that you built out over time? Um, can you repeat that question? Yeah, I mean, is there a theme that you started from and then you've kind of moved beyond? Or are you just kind of using the expertise that you gain to build a proper responsive theme? I think we just decided to do it in a particular way. I mean, there's responsive design is just, you know, it's like just, I don't know. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but ultimately it's just like where you position breakpoints. In Drupal, a lot of times that's around, you know, regions. Uh, I think that's where we tend to do a lot of it, like within our base, but then on our specific projects, we do it. You know, there's like unique needs in each team that we find. Um, the only, so if I remember correctly, the only actual media queries and breakpoints that we have when we're starting prototype from scratch is just basic uh, sidebar first and sidebar last that positions those off to the side. And then that's it, because every design is different. And that's something that if we assume too much with that in prototype, it's something we're going to have to strip out and override on every project. And that ends up creating more work. So the idea is just to put those tools in there in place so we can just get in and use them when we're ready. Thank you. Yep. Um, so one of the things Drupal does that we all love is that it creates a million SDGs and a zillion classes on stuff and, um, you know, with all this object oriented CSS and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm finding we want to rename all our classes and so on and so forth. What is the line where you uh, do a lot of pre processing stuff? How much of Drupal do you change or leave alone in your work? How much do we change? Yeah. Are you changing the whole you can't read things? Yeah, that was a point that we didn't really touch upon uh, fully when we were talking about center prototype. But we know that we use this like certain module kit um, to you know affect our um, you know maybe our menus or our fields or whatever, and so we can anticipate that with our our base.
release and create the game function overrides that we know we're going to use. Uh, I think one that we have just like right at the top of our template file is uh, like we have the game uh, override for menus, and then we also have one for menu items. Uh, we know that we want certain classes on there, and we can just kind of like expect that as soon as we you know hit the switch and start using the theme. Um, but you know that's not like something that would be necessarily a good thing to <laughs> abstract out um, and, or. I, I guess it wouldn't be good to expect that from contrib because then there's like assumptions being made about like the modules, which you know we do that because we we, we, we can make that decision because we know how you know it works at that. But yeah, I think I would say that like as far as you know when do we override something when do we deal with what's there, it really comes down to. Um, is it worth it at the time? You know, we like as clean markup as possible, but it's, you know, there's some things that it's, you know, you just have to look the other way. But we do try to carry it to your just type totally <laughs> overwriting everything. It sounds like, you know, some of the people we spoke with, uh, like, that's definitely what they're trying to do. They're trying to just, like, get Drupal out of the way and use it as, like, a just strictly for, like, they're using it less presentationally and more just as like the content management control of like you know placement of blocks, um, you know, getting things. Drupal is an awesome system and it offers us so many things, but sometimes we feel like a little uh, overly influenced by its like root system, and some people uh, get around that in like kind of abnormal ways. So uh, I think Code Enigma is a really great example of that, and I would definitely recommend. Thanks. We've tried uh, several different techniques for um, putting together the front end, and one thing we found, like with Omega, for example, we were using it for a while, but we found just it would include all sorts of extra CSS and JavaScript, and same with other methods. And so what we're doing these days is we're going with a custom theme, um, and we're literally stripping out everything as far as CSS and JavaScript from Drupal mm -hmm. and only including the stuff we want and we get a huge performance boost. But what my question is, have you guys considered doing that approach? And if so, why or why not have you not implemented that in your, in your solution? That's definitely a dream for us. Like, uh, both, as far as the CSS goes, we are stripping out most of core CSS. We leave some of the stuff in there. Um, you know, we've copied over system.css and converted it to SAS stripped out the stuff that we, we don't need. And then we usually use something like 7 as an admin theme where a lot of that CSS is really needed. And so it'll get included when it needs to. As far as JavaScript goes, um, that's definitely something we want to do. It's something that um, Garrett's been working on. We're not there yet as far as including it. Um, yeah, that's a little harder to do because JavaScript has a lot of like functional implications with like forms API and various other like administrative yeah. pieces of Drupal. And you can't just like mess well you you can just blow it up and get rid of it, but you know, if you're using like the node form and you're using, you know, Ajax in the fields, uh, then that's not like a, an option that we have a lot of time to like we don't have a lot of time to spend on solving that right now as far as like the payoff's not really there. We just use like jQuery from core uh, because we just need like the you know node reference to work because we're we've got like a, uh, our team's like user facing at some point and you know I think that um, that also comes down to you know who's on your team and do you have the resources for someone to manage all that those JavaScript dependencies on every site if you look at um, that death of the themer video they're pretty much just destroying everything like as far as JavaScript goes and just including like you said what you need. Thank you. If you you said you are doing that? Yes, and um, part of it is um, basically like we the only JavaScript we're including is the contextual links so that they can okay. edit blocks on the page. And we've basically decided anywhere we're gonna use Ajax is gonna be custom. It's not gonna be the Drupal stuff. Cool. Um, and maybe it's a pipe dream. We haven't totally used it in a lot of our uh, it's pretty new for us, and so we're, we're still kind of, um, you know, 
learning, but we've just found that it's been a lot easier. We don't have some weird, you know, CSS specifically in there that uh, we're doing it to fix some of the other CSS that's being included somewhere else that we're not sure of, but it was doing something in certain ways. And, but we found a cleaner solution in that way, but I just, yeah, I'm not sure if it's the best for us, but we're, that's kind of where we're at right now, so cool. Thank you. Um, I'm about to sound really ignorant because I am about this stuff generally, but um, I started building a Drupal site from scratch by downloading the, the Acquia bundle that just kind of like sets you up with the fundamentals. And um, it seemed really great and awesome. And then the people I was working for wanted to use this blog press theme that presented like bunch of limitations and stuff. Um, so I was wondering about the, uh, the utility theme that you guys were talking about. Um, did you do that through downloading the Acquia bundle and then just adding modules and customizing it? Or was no, that's, that's all custom. Uh, all custom. The, yeah, the pure theme is, you look at Examiner, they, I mean, I was there for I think three months before I ever saw the Drupal admin interface. Everything they do is in code. You know, there's no, they don't use views. Um, everything's written by scratch. And that's, again, comes down to like, what are your resources and who's on your team? You've got a whole team of developers that can focus and maintain that code. Of course, thank you. I just wanted to uh, say that I, I, I was dependent on Zen for many years, and then I switched over to Adopt the Theme, and then I just said, you know, let's just go ahead and do this. I'm tired of overwriting tabs, and I'm tired of overwriting pagination, and all that kind of stuff. It's just really inefficient that you're declaring all the CSS only to overwrite it, and then something sneaks through, like let it be the graphics on the on a word list and all that kind of stuff. So I recently did this, and I'm so much happier for it because I know now it's given me a new level of understanding of the theming layer. And uh, I know exactly where everything is, and uh, it's a lot simpler than it sounds. So I definitely copy over, start, start playing with it. One of the first things I did was unset a ton of, um, not a ton, I think about a half a dozen or so of the, of the core uh, CSS files until it started hurting, like system.css. I unset that, and to hear you say, oh, well, copy it over and keep what you need, convert it to SAS. It's a great idea. I'll do that next. So thanks. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, also worthwhile mentioning, like, there's, of course, like, when you're creating a base theme uh, from scratch, there's definitely, like, overhead when you do that the first time. Like, the idea is that uh, you're going to be using this and iterating on it over and over and over, so just trying to keep talking to staff and asking questions. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, I, I work with these guys, so it's a little weird to ask any questions, but I just thought of it. Um, so, what do you think about how this affects the user space, I guess is my question. I, some of your, some of the people you talked to, it looked like had uh, posted code on Drupal.org, but if that code is developed for their unique use cases, um, I'm wondering, is it really, like, what is the reason for doing that? Is it, what is the reason for contributing it back? Yeah, like, is it really practical for other people? Like, if everyone's creating base themes for their specific needs, I, it, it creates like an exchange of information there. I think if we don't like continue like really leverage like contrib spaces and open source, uh, then everybody's kind of like off in their own land. And uh, so that's more a way for front end developers to be talking, to sharing with each other, not reusable code, but reusable ideas. Maybe yeah, reusable code. And I mean, that's where I cut my Drupal, my Drupal tomatoes in, in the contrib space, like using contrib. And, like, there's never going to be a reason to, like, do away with contrib uh, in theming. It's, like, a great starting point, I, I think. Um, but eventually, like this guy just mentioned, you know, you start to become frustrated. That's when you should, you know, make that transition. And I think any uh, theme out there, and especially popular ones, started because they weren't happy with what was already out there. Um, and as far as making this stuff, either, you know, we're advocating that you 
create this specific to your process. There's probably others out there that have a very similar process and can use it. Um, that's another good reason for, like we talked about Pure, in that that has a specific function. You know, that can be reused by a lot of people. You know, it came out of a specific need. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that you can have a, a ton of themes that all inherit each other. So most, in most cases, somebody has a single base theme and then the custom theme for that project. But you can, like we saw with, with Stanford, they actually have, you know, as many as three themes, um, all kind of inheriting, and each one has its specific, um, I guess, piece of functionality it provides. So not quite as modular as modules, but you can kind of take it. went to download center and prototype to take a look at them and there are no releases. Are there going to be releases or do I just have to Yeah, actually um, those have been sandbox projects until about 10 o'clock this morning. So figured actually like I said, we've been working on them you know, internally and iterating on them but um, we wanted wanted a sandbox project isn't as accessible. But to answer your question yes, there will be releases just haven't set that up yet. All right. Um, if you can, let us know what you thought of the session. Um, you know, what we can improve on. If you liked anything, didn't like anything. Um, but it's basically the, um, the actual URL for the, the session. Yeah, you can just go to our session page. There will be a link. Judgment on us, please. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>